Well, last, let's see, uh, last week, like seven days ago, I, I was out in Minnesota for, for a week, and I was out, out there taking my last covenant orientation class. I um, spent five days taking covenant history. So this is Modesto Covenant Church, and we are part of the Evangelical Covenant Church, a, a denomination in North America. And, and, and it was five days learning about our covenant history. Uh, different flavors, different um, developments of, of theology and, and practice, um, different scandals in the church. There's not many, don't worry. But there are some really interesting ones. The Alaskan gold scandal, look it up. One, one of the things that I really appreciated as I learned the history of the covenant is that the earliest covenanters were called mission friends. They, they were people who were committed to each other, they were friends, and they were committed to God and his mission. So these mission friends later became known as covenanters. And today I, I, I want to talk about mission friends and how I hope and, and I pray and I, I do see that this theme of mission friends is alive in this church and alive in this community and it's informed by scripture. So I invite you now to open your Bible to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be mostly in Luke today with some, some other verses added in there too. So we are in Luke 10 um, starting at verse 1. Not John. Not John 10. Luke 10. Luke is the third book in the New Testament. It's the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. There we go. Luke ch chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. And if the head of the house loves peace, your peace will rest on that house. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for workers deserve their wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. Amen. So my name is Ted Burroughs. I am pastor of Mission and Discipleship here at Modesto Covenant. And as pastor of Mission, verses like these have always excited me. I've, I've always had a heart for missions, and pretty much wherever the Bible says go, I get excited. This, this, is, this is a missions verse. It, and as we've been thinking about missional communities here on our Sunday series, th this, this is a verse which will inform how we live that out as God's missional community here in Modesto. Now, in these verses, we see Jesus commissioning his followers to go out as lambs among wolves. They're armed with nothing but a revolutionary message. And this is indeed a revolution, but it's not a revolution like his followers may have wanted. Now, just a chapter earlier, Jesus had predicted his death twice. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the, uh, by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And then also he says, the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to human hands. This is, this is a dangerous setting. It's tense. And immediately after Jesus says these statements, he goes towards the Samaritan village. But they do not welcome Jesus. They do not show him hospitality on his way towards Jerusalem. The offense was so great that the disciples of Jesus asked him if they should send fire down on that village. They, they wanted a revolution. They wanted a, a revolution of power, a, a militaristic revolution, a political revolution, a revolution of, of power in human terms. But that's not what Jesus gives them. Here in chapter 10, Jesus' revolution, his strategy, takes a different tact. Where his followers wanted war, 
Jesus' divine plan of revolution is through the totally unexpected path of peace and friendship. Jesus would send his followers out, two by two, friends with friends. And on the road, they would encourage each other, they would, they would share their resources with one another, and they would pray for each other. This is a different kind of revolution, this revolution of peace. Jesus sends his followers out vulnerable. He doesn't send them out in mass, armed to the teeth with weapons of warfare. No purse or bag or sandals even. They were to speak the language of peace and rely entirely on the hospitality of others, of strangers. Now, like the 70 elders chosen by Moses to lead the people um, in, in the Exodus, up out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, Jesus here chooses 72 disciples to go out in his name, leading a new exodus, rescuing the people not only from the oppression of Rome, but also from the oppression and overwhelming burden of sin and brokenness that enchain them. Now, one thing that jumps out to me here as I read through these verses is where, Jesus, where it says, Jesus sent them out ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. It's important that we notice that Jesus is about to go there. These are the evangelists in the truest sense of the words. These are the ones who bear the message, the king is coming. Now the word evangelism has a lot of baggage these days. Um, it, it, it's, it's often misunderstood, and people often confuse evangelism with evangelicalism. I, I once saw both terms used interchangeably in an, in an article, and it just it made zero sense. Now, for the record, evan evangelical, it basically means somebody who believes that Jesus is the Messiah and he died and rose again, and that the Bible is the Word of God relevant for life today. In its purest meaning, evangelical has nothing to do with political parties or taste in music. Now, evangelism, though, it, it, it obviously has the same roots, evangel, um, but it has a different meaning than evangelical. Quite simply, evangelism is telling the good news that Jesus is king and that his kingdom is near. This is the message that Jesus equips those that, who he sends out ahead of him, saying, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, I don't know what your reaction to this word evangelism is or, or what your experience is with it. Um, I, I, I would bet that it's somewhere in between enthusiastic, like, yeah, let's go get them, to embarrassed or maybe cringe or, oh, I hope he doesn't mess this up. Now, I myself have, have experienced a spectrum of emotional responses to this word, evangelism. I've, I've been enthusiastic. I, I've, I've um, been embarrassed. So just a, a, a couple stories about that. I remember when I was... Uh, 18 years old, I just finished my first year and, um, in, in college, and I went over to the East Coast, and I did a summer mission project with the campus ministry. And one thing that we often did there was we, we paired off into groups of two, and we went sharing. This was the language. And, and, and you'd go around, and you'd look for people on the boardwalk to talk to, um, to, to go share with, and usually, um, you know, Honestly, usually it was some unsuspecting person, and uh, often it was a very awkward conversation, and everybody was happy when, when it ended, <laughs> myself included. But it, it's true that God did use those conversations, or, or he used um, many of them. I, I remember one time I, uh, I, I went up to this guy, and I just kind of shared the gospel with him, and on the spot, he, he seemed to encounter Jesus and say that he wanted more of Jesus in his life, and, and so I said, hey, that's great, that's great. Why don't, we, why don't we pray? And this guy, it was obviously the first time he had ever tried praying, and um, he used some very colorful language <laughs> in his prayers. But as, as we were praying, I thought, this is the best prayer I've ever been a part of, because... <laughs> It's so genuine, and God is so stoked that this guy is talking to him for probably the first time. So God does use that kind of evangelism where, you know, just kind of on the spot, sometimes awkward, but...
but sometimes glorifying to the Lord. It's not always that way, though. Um, I, I also have this funny time when I was walking around, and we were going two by two, door to door, and uh, I, I don't do this any, anymore, but God bless if you feel called to do that. Um, but anyway, I, I, we were going door to door, and walked up to this one house, and on the porch there was this guy, and he was surrounded by these gallon jugs of water. And I said, hey, excuse me, sir, do you have a minute to talk about Jesus? And he said, sure, I'm not doing anything, just waiting to pass this kidney stone. <laughs> All right. Well, Jesus, yeah, anyway. But that was cool, I got to talk to that guy. God uses all circumstances. Uh, but one, one time also I went sharing with a staff member, and this guy was about 45 years old, and I was 18, and I was new to this, and I was kind of excited but also scared. And, uh, and, and he's 45, and I was thinking like, oh, this guy's an expert, he's going to know what to do, but I want to do it right because I'm a recovering perfectionist. And, um, <laughs> and the, so, so I said to this guy like, oh, I'm really, I'm really nervous about doing this. And I was expecting him to say, like, hey, no problem, you know, God is good, you'll, you'll do fine, whatever. But instead, he, he, he said, yeah, I hate doing this. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was totally shocked, right? Because I was expecting him. He's like staff with this campus ministry, and just he should be awesome, and he should love it. But he, he said he hated doing it. And I was totally shocked, and I was like, wait, isn't this what Christians have to do, don't we have to, isn't this the only way to do it? Um, so, so I thank God for, for this guy because uh, he, he kind of shocked me into a new way of thinking. And as I've gotten older and matured in my faith, I, I um, appreciate his honesty. I appreciate that while God does use, um, you know, these kind of spur-of-the-moment conversations, he also can use a different strategy for evangelism, for sharing the good news that Jesus is Lord. And here in chapter 10, we see one of those strategies, the strategy of friendship. He says, When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. The strategy is so simple. It's one of friendship. First, he says, eat. Now, when we eat, we spend time around a table. We, we spend time with people. We're present to each other. Eating can build relationships. The word companion in Latin comes, comes from the word with bread. A companion is someone with whom you eat. Everybody has to eat. It's, it's you know, one of our basic human needs. And so coming around the table, you're, you're recognizing that this is a basic thing that everybody does. It draws us together in our shared human experience. And then also, eating can be used for celebration. Um, th th think of these well-versed kids up here. I would bet that the families of these well-versed kids will um, probably have some great lunch today, maybe with some friends or family who came up to see it, and, and they're going to have kind of a special time of celebration. And if they weren't planning it, then they have to do it now. We might go out just to celebrate what they did. That's, a, that's also an idea. So eating is also for celebration, and, and celebration brings humans together. Eating is the giving and receiving of hospitality. Now, I might say this word hospitality, and some of you might, um, might suddenly like kind of recoil at that. Uh, some of us are afraid to give hospitality. Maybe, maybe because you feel like it needs to be like Martha Stewart and perfect and, uh, and, and you, you don't want that kind of pressure. You feel like you can't live up to that hospitality. Or maybe you just don't want to risk allowing somebody into your space. You don't want to give any time. You don't want to, um, in a sense, be vulnerable to this relationship. And some of us also might have difficulty in receiving hospitality. Maybe, maybe we're a little bit stubborn and we, uh, we, we, we don't like the thought of anybody providing for us because we want to do it ourselves. So giving and receiving of hospitality is something which builds friendships. It builds relationships. It takes humility to eat with one another. If you've ever had a serious conflict with somebody, you know that eating with them is a challenge. 
And that eating also can sometimes be healing. Jesus also tells his disciples to heal the sick. Now what we see here is that the gospel is not only just some, some idea that people um, you know, believe in their brain and then they go on with the rest of their lives and they're good. Jesus is concerned about our minds and our souls. But Jesus also is concerned about the body, about the heart. He says, heal the people. Now, this, this holistic sense of the gospel, the, the sense that the gospel is the message of peace, the message of shalom, of, of wholeness, of, of wellness, of flourishing. We, we, we don't just flourish in our minds, but we, we can flourish um, mind, body, soul, heart. And that is what the gospel speaks into. Some of our uh, mission partners here at Modesto Covenant Church, we have a lot of great mission, missionaries, and, uh, and thank you for those who, who pray and support them. Some of our mission partners, um, like Charlotte Duell, she's committed to something called community health evangelism, where she wants to speak the gospel, but she's also concerned about the, the holistic gospel, the, the wellness of the people who receive. There is healing in what she does. And then the last thing that Jesus says here is, tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. Tell them the kingdom of peace has come near. Because you see that Jesus is king. He is the prince of peace. He is the king of peace. And his kingdom is one of peace. It is one of shalom. One theologian says that uh, peace is when things are as they should be. So if Jesus is the Prince of Peace and His kingdom is a kingdom of peace, and the message is that the kingdom of peace is near, it makes sense that this message should go to a people of peace. Now, of course, this message is for all people. All are welcomed. Jesus is Lord of all. But it is the people of peace who will receive the message with hospitality, who will receive the messenger with hospitality. So what are we talking about when we think of a person of peace? Actually, Joey, um, just in, in the song with the drum and thinking about uh, the, like the gospel sort of resonates in our hearts and, and when we're, we're made for, to be in rhythm with God, I think that that's an indicator of a person of peace, somebody in whom this good news of peace um, re resounds. People of peace, you could say, are friends of the gospel. Maybe it's an old friend, maybe it's a new friend, maybe it's a not yet friend. But a person of peace is one who receives the good news of Jesus. Now when Jesus says, enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. So, so we see again this message of peace coming to people of peace. A person of peace is someone who welcomes. I, I, I think of um, when I was, let's see, I think I was 20 years old. I went on another um, summer mission project. This time I went to Morocco, to Casablanca. And uh, if, if, if you know it, Morocco, um, it's a great country. It's full of North Africans, obviously and uh, some, some beautiful culture, some great people that we met. Um, one time, a friend and I were a little bit lost, and we asked these two young guys, um, hey, where's, where's this certain road? And they, they took us arm in arm, and they walked us like half a mile to show us where it was. That was a simple gesture of welcoming and hospitality. But I want to talk about a friend, and I'll change his name, so I'll call him Khalil. And Khalil in Arabic means friend. Khalil was a friend for our summer in Morocco. We, we met him um, probably like at a cafe or something. Um, to be honest, I can't remember. But he invited us to his house. We, we went up into their, their dining room. It was upstairs. And we reclined and, and we talked. And um, he served us tea. 
we, we would go for, just over the summer, we would walk around downtown, we'd go to the boardwalk, we, th there's this um, beautiful area with like cafe tables just overlooking the ocean, and uh, spent a lot of time with him there. And this was back when I was single, but um, one time at this cafe, there were some ladies sitting at a table over there, and, uh, and my friend Khalil was like, hey, let me introduce you. I said no. But that's what friends do. So here's a friend. And, and he welcomed us into his life, and, and we, we just kind of connected. And so we spent time with him. We, we stayed with him. Jesus says, stay with those people. Now, a person of peace not only welcomes you, but they also listen to you. A, a, a person of peace listens to this message that a, the kingdom of God is near. They're not combative. They're not mocking. Not always, at least. I've, I, w just thinking about Khalil, um, the more we spend time with him, he's like, hey, you know, what do you guys believe about God? Muslims are very open to talking about God. It's awesome. And he'd say, what do you think about God? And we told him about Jesus. And the more we talked about it, you know, some of it was very new to him, but, um, and, and, and just exciting to see him start to understand who, who this Jesus was and how Jesus offered him friendship. And he'd ask us, you know, what, what, is, uh, what, what is the Bible to you and, and what is the, the gospel to you? Um, what is the Trinity? And we just spent time with him and, and unpacked these different um, truths about God. So he, he listened to us. He was open to that. And then a person of peace is also one who serves you. Jesus says, eat what is given to you. Now this, this message in the time of Jesus was radical, that um, we, we should eat what is given to us. And we think about last week, Mark talked about Peter and uh, God's call to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And Peter's like, I'm not going to go to the Gentiles. They're unclean. But in a dream, God says to him, rise, kill, and eat. And he shows him all these um, animals which are not kosher. And Peter says, I'm not doing that. That's unclean. And God says, rise, kill, eat. Take the gospel across cultural boundaries. Take it to the Gentiles. And, and, and we see how the gospel is for all people, not just, not just one people, not just us. So with Khalil... He, when, when, he, uh, when he invited us to eat with him, this was actually a very easy thing to do in Morocco. I don't know if you have had Moroccan food, but it's one of the best in the world. Uh, we, we had several meals with him. We had tagine with, with lamb and, and um, prunes and this delicious sauce you dip the bread into. Amen. We had couscous, you know, chicken. We had vegetable couscous. Um, again, just... Really, some of, some of the best food that I've ever eaten was in Morocco. The, the tea is very minty and very sweet, and they pour it from a very high, like, and it bubbles up, and it's cool. They eat, like, on couches. It's, it's like, maybe the best culture in the world. <laughs> so, actually, as I was thinking about, you know, eating what is put before you, in Morocco, it was very easy to do that. So let me tell you a story about a time when it wasn't so easy to do that. Uh, it, just after graduating college, I went to China, and I taught English there for a year and a half. And my, my first day in China, I got invited out with a couple other American friends to this tiny little village in China. And uh, we were invited into a home which, I mean, it was like a 10 by 10 foot um, house made of, of cinder blocks and there was concrete, and gray was the only color unless it was dirt. So it, it was this like little kind of dirty, this very simple hovel house. And, uh, and, and, and they welcomed us in, and they invited us, uh, they invited us to sit at this table. And the table was um, probably about this low, and the chairs that we sat on, they looked like we could have used them in, in children's church. So just tiny little chairs at a tiny little table. And before us on the table was something called hot pot. Now, if you've had hot pot, you probably love it. It's like a big soup on the middle with fire underneath, and so it's bubbling over, and it's really good um, if you have the right ingredients. 
And, and what you do is you take your ingredient and you, it's, it's raw on a plate and then you put it into the hot pot, it cooks and then you eat it and it's delicious. But this day was my first day in China and this hot pot was unlike any other hot pot I've had since. The, the ingredients for the hot pot was, uh, was, was something that I call blood tofu. It was like, to it, it, it was blood which has congealed and uh, they cut it into cubes and it looks a little bit like tofu, but really it's just blood. So I ate that. They put it before me and I ate it. And you know, it wasn't what we eat here regularly in, uh, in California. So it was definitely crossing cultural boundaries, but I ate it because I, I appreciated their hospitality and I wanted to show gratitude. And, and not only did I eat that blood tofu, but then there was also um, sheep stomach, which again is not a regular thing that I eat, or, or goat stomach rather, not a regular thing. Sheep stomach's fine. <laughs> but it, there, there's this like goat stomach and it looks very foreign to me. But I, I tried that. That was harder. And then I, I go around the corner to the bathroom, if you can call it that, and, uh, and I see my um, little friend, the goat, who had given his life and him was still hanging there, dripping blood onto the concrete. So, eat what is set before you. <laughs> since, you, you know, since then, like, I've always thought, I'm going to try everything at least once, and uh, especially if it's for the sake of the gospel, I'll try it. So, just to recap, Jesus sends his followers ahead of him to announce the good news that the kingdom of God is near, this, this revolutionary message, and also saying that the revolution is not won through the sword, but through friendship. Eat, heal, and tell the good news. Now, just as a case study, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Luke 19, one to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. <laughs> you, you may know that song. Um, last night I was talking about these passages with my wife over dinner, with our kids there. And uh, my five-year-old, as I was telling him about Zacchaeus, she's like, I know, I know, Dad. I, I, I know that story. So it's, it's a story which um, maybe we learn even from a very young age, the story of Zacchaeus. Who was this man? Well, we know that he was short, and we know that he was chief tax collector. We know that he was hated by the community. He was probably hated by the community because as a chief tax collector and says he's very wealthy, he probably cut some corners. He probably took where um, it was not owed. He, he, he um, exploited the community. This is not a, a nice man. He's not a good man, even though he's short. So what happens when we see this, the, the, the story in Zacchaeus? What happens? 
Well, he, he, even though he is despised by the community, he, he wants to see what's going on with Jesus because, you know, he's heard, he's heard some things and uh, he can't see over the crowd, so he climbs up a tree. And Jesus, with all these people around him, he looks up and he sees Zacchaeus in the tree. And he says, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, this, this verse, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today, it, it grabs my attention. Because we see what happens as Jesus looks into the eyes of Zacchaeus. Um, Zacchaeus' heart basically melts. He comes down immediately and he encounters the Prince of Peace. He, he welcomes Jesus. And welcoming Jesus, he repents on the spot. And he makes reparations, reparations for, his, for his crimes, basically. And, and his, his re- his repentance is a response to encountering God. It's very easy to think back to Luke 18, just one chapter earlier, when we hear the story about the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler has it all together, and he sees Jesus, and he says, Hey, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, Give away your wealth and and follow me. And the ruler goes away saddened because he was a man of great wealth, and he doesn't want to do that. So comparing these two stories, we see that Zacchaeus gives away half his wealth, and and he repays four times his debts, even before Jesus asks him to. Salvation preceded the repentance. God's love, God's friendship, inspired the repentance, not the other way around. God's grace is not dependent upon our works. And, and what else do we learn about the Prince of Peace here? I just love how Jesus sees through all the noise, all the crowd, and he sees up in this tree this, this wee little man. And I get the sense that even though Zacchaeus is he's curious, he's also kind of hiding. He, he wants to be on the fringe. He's heard good things about Jesus, but... He's not so sure who it is, and, and so he's, he's watching from afar. But Christ calls him to him right, right there. And then the crowd says, see how Jesus has he, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. I love that. That, that. That's a theme which we see throughout the book of Luke, how God goes to the sinners, God goes to the marginalized, he, he, he comes to seek and save that which is lost. We see that the Prince of Peace is, is not seeking perfect people. The Prince of Peace is seeking people of peace who will receive him, who, who will accept his friendship. And so as, as I'm reading through this story of Zacchaeus, I feel like God is, is saying even to me, hey Ted, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Because it's, it's so easy. I mean, even, even if you've been a believer for a long time or, or um, maybe today is your first time you've ever heard the good news of Jesus. But it's so easy to, to hide from Jesus or to say, hey, ugh, not today, God. Um, you know, like, I, I just don't want to think about you today tomorrow is cool. But Jesus says, don't put it off another day. It's immediate. I must stay at your house today. So if, if you perhaps are like Zacchaeus and you're in the tree and you, you know, maybe God was like, hey, go check out church today. I think God might be talking to you that today is the day that he stays in your house. I want to move now and, and talk about um, John 15, verse 15 and 16. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go 
and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So again, as the gospel, this, this gospel of the kingdom of peace has come into my life, I first need to receive that and be a person of peace to Jesus. But upon receiving this peace from God, I can't just sit there and, and twiddle my thumbs. God calls me, God calls each one of us to take this message, to, to go and bear fruit, not because we're servants, but because we are his friends, because we are his mission friends. So as people of peace, just like our, our mission friend, covenanters, um, 130 years ago did. We want to be a people who encounter Christ. We want to encounter Christ in His Word as we, as we open it up. We want to encounter Christ in prayer. We want to encounter Christ as we worship Him, as we play, and, and have, that, have that relationship with Christ, that friendship with Christ. And as mission friends, we are also called to encourage one another. Because as we know, the life of faith is not an easy one, and the road is not easy, and there is dangers along the way. And so we can encourage one another with, with words, with, with gifts, uh, by bringing a box of apricots to, to your friend. And then also, we are called as mission friends to engage in God's mission. We, we, we're called to bring that message of the kingdom of peace. Now, one, one kind of potential confusion is, okay, as a person of peace, are we talking about somebody in the church or outside the church? And I think the answer is both. Because there, there are people in here who, who, I mean, there's some awesome friendships. I, I look around, I see your faces. I know some of you have been friends for for years and years, I know some of you are brand new friends, and uh, just that there's a lot of good connection happening, and and I, I celebrate that. But people of peace also are people, you know. There's, I don't know, 200 people in this room, and all of us have friends outside of this building, and that is awesome, and that is where God, and the kingdom of God, will expand as we. Go and, and we talk to our friends, our neighbors. Um, I was talking with one of you the other day, and um, you were saying how uh, as, as you're talking to your neighbors, you're also praying internally and saying, God, what are you doing in the life of this person? How can, how can I speak peace into this life? And that's something which we all can do. We don't need to be scared of it. We don't need to be awkward about it. Just be yourself. Be real. And talk about what Jesus has done for you. Talk about um, the, the peace that you have. Now, we want to be not only hearers of the word, we also want to be doers of the word. Jesus says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And so, as, as, as I invite the worship band to come up and, and lead us in the more songs and worshiping God. I want us to take a few minutes to reflect on the questions on, on the back of your bulletin. Uh, who are people that, that you're praying for? Who can you see as people of peace who might receive the good news of Jesus? How can you encourage these people this week? Maybe it's, you know, send them a note. Maybe it's buy them a cup of coffee. Maybe it's you don't talk to them for a week. And then also to ask, how is God calling us? How else is God calling us to engage in his mission? If you're having a hard time thinking of people of peace who maybe God has put in your life, if, if you're having a hard time doing that, then you probably need to get out more. You know, go uh, jo join a club, pick up a hobby, go for walks, whatever it is. Um, find, find ways where you can build friendships and speak God's life and God's peace. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close to pray to close. And Joey and, and the musicians will continue us in worship. Oh God, thank you that you call us friend. 
Lord, thank you that you are the Prince of Peace and that you bring peace into this world by your blood, by your sacrifice, by your friendship. God, I pray that you would open up the doors now and the opportunities and give us courage and vision and um, enthusiasm to, to find friends, to make friends, to um, speak your good news to people of peace who you have laid in our path. 